Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we're past nine, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks to everyone again for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Anjali Roan, and I'm the Senior Associate for Humanitarian Communications at Women Deliver. I'll be guiding you through this webinar. Um, but to kick us off, I will turn it over to Sue Mbaya, the African Union Director of Crisis Action, to provide some welcome remarks. Over to you, Sue. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, a very special welcome to everyone. I see that we have crisis action colleagues from all our various offices, so welcome. And a particularly warm welcome to colleagues who are joining crisis action from our core partner organizations. Uh, we are really, really pleased that you were able to make time to join and that you will find this webinar really relevant and useful to your work. I'd like to invite each one of you to introduce yourselves, as already been mentioned um, in the chat, by typing your name there if you haven't done that already. Now, I'm sure that you're all aware that as part of the, uh, the current organizational strategy, Crisis Action has committed to addressing gender concerns strategically in our work. In so doing, we've acknowledged that uh, we really need to be more systematic in adopting a gender-aware approach um, in all that we do. So to help us with this commitment, uh, Crisis Action has entered a partnership uh, with Women Deliver. We, we all know what Women Deliver. Um, it's a leading global advocate for gender equality uh, and for the health and rights of girls and women. Much like Crisis Action, they build capacity, they forge partnerships, together creating coalitions and action to spark um, political commitment uh, and investment in girls and women. Now, Women Deliver has kindly um, entered this partnership with us to provide us with the technical support that we need um, as we pursue these gender change goals um, that we have committed to. This uh, webinar is, a, is an exciting activity under this partnership uh, with Women Deliver. So just this morning, something very interesting happened. Uh, somebody who I really admire uh, inspired me with a principle which I'm going to put into practice right here and now. He said to me, brevity is brilliance. So in the spirit of brevity, I'll simply say thank you so, so much, Women Deliver. Thank you to our core partners who are joining us. And I'm handing over immediately to Anadi uh, to launch us into today's training. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, on behalf of Women Deliver, we're also so grateful for our partnership with Crisis Action, and we hope that this webinar is the beginning of many more great collaborations to come. Uh, so with that, let me just move to the next slide. Um, I also wanted to introduce two other speakers who will present case studies from their work throughout the presentation. We're pleased to be joined by Elizabeth Ashamu Jang, who is the Regional Rights and Crisis Advocacy Advisor for Oxfam for the Horn East and Central Africa region. Uh, she previously supported Oxfam's regional advocacy on the South Sudan conflict and the regional refugee situation. She's a human rights lawyer by background and has also worked with Amnesty and Human Rights Watch conducting research on the human rights situation in South Sudan. And we're also joined by Olivia Nightingale, who is the Program Officer for Civil and Political Rights and Humanitarian Response for the American Jewish World Service, where she works on the Rohingya crisis among several other portfolios. So thank you both for joining the conversation, um, and we look forward to hearing from you very soon. Through this webinar, we really hope to share some best practices for elevating the voices of girls and women uh, in humanitarian advocacy campaigns, including guidance for doing so in a safe and respectful way. This webinar, uh, for your, just to note, will have a strong focus on international advocacy opportunities specifically. So things like speaking opportunities at high level meetings at the UN, publication and top tier global media and other activities with global decision makers as the primary audience. So to that end, we've split up the webinar into three segments. The first will focus on choosing stories, including guidance for identifying the right advocate for any given advocacy opportunity that you might be pursuing in your own work. The second segment will focus on collecting stories with girls and women in a really collaborative and respectful way. And finally, we'll be sharing some tactics and some case studies that'll show how to elevate these stories 
And we really want this webinar to be as interactive as possible. So we'll have a short presentation and case study for each of the segments, um, followed by exercises where we'll, where we'll open it up to all attendees. I'll unmute all the microphones and we'll, we'll love to hear your perspectives and questions. And if you have any questions at any time during the presentations, please feel free to write them in the chat box, selecting to all panelists and attendees in the drop down menu. And we'll make sure to address those questions at the end of each section. With that, um, let's get started with our first segment of the webinar, which is focused on choosing stories. As many of you might know from your own work, storytelling in general uh, is very different from storytelling with a specific advocacy objective and audience in mind. In order to reach an advocacy goal, we know that we must be really strategic in selecting the types of stories and spokespeople that we want to be elevated. And so to help you to make a decision of which stories to choose from and the right storyteller for any given advocacy opportunity, we've created this decision tree. From left to right are the questions we really encourage you to ask yourself before determining whose story you need. On the left, there is why do we need grassroots voices present, moving to what is the nature of the opportunity available, then keep in mind when and where the advocacy opportunity takes place, who the profile of the person is for the opportunity and what the strategic message we hope to get across through their storytelling. The answers of all these questions will have implications on who is the right profile for the opportunity and what the strategic message should be. But problematically, many storytelling efforts actually start with the who and what question. And I think we've all seen this before. It's when you get an email requesting your team to identify a girl or a woman to speak on a panel or at another opportunity, and there's already kind of a laid out expectation of what their background is and what should, they should talk about through that experience. Unfortunately, we know from our experience that this can actually result in tokenistic engagement. So that's why we really encourage you to consider the first three questions as uh, first three questions first. Why, how, when, and where? Because they'll have strong implications on who you might approach for the opportunity. So let's start with our first question to ask ourselves when an advocacy opportunity for a girl or woman from a humanitarian setting arises. Why do we even need grassroots voices present in this discussion? It's so important to ask why at the outset to ensure that the opportunity itself, by its very nature, is set up for their meaningful engagement. So here are some considerations to make while looking at the opportunity. Does it provide an opportunity for girls and women to share their exp expertise, experience, and proposed solutions, or only for them to come forward to share their suffering? I think while the latter is certainly important and can have an impact, we must also acknowledge that girls and women are not only experts on the problems they face, but also the solutions that they need. Similarly, another question to ask yourself is, are they invited to share a story as part of a campaign or product that they helped create or produce, or something that they didn't help shape? There are situations we see where organizations launch reports on a given issue and girls and women who are never involved in the report's creation and indeed may have never even read it are invited to launch events to those launch events to share their story. This actually tokenizes and takes advantage of their expertise rather than integrates it in the decision making process itself. Other questions to ask yourself about the opportunity are here. Are they able to shape their contributions freely, or is the organizer imposing a strict expectation of what they must say and include at the outset? Also, will there be transparency about how their story or contributions will be implemented or act upon? Will you be able or will there be somebody on your team available to brief the girl or woman about the purpose of this advocacy opportunity and what it may or may not achieve? Just as an example of this, we recently heard from a women-led organization in Syria that a representative was invited to speak at the Security Council, but left upset because the situation for girls and women didn't change as a result of her remarks. And the problem here is not that it's not the opportunity itself, but that there was no one there to clearly set expectations of what may or may not result from this moment so that they can make an informed decision about their participation. 
just moving ahead uh, to some more questions to ask. Do uh, does the girl or woman have an opportunity to contribute to the overall agenda setting of the meeting, shaping what the meeting looks like, its objectives? Of course, this is not always possible, especially in, especially in events that have predetermined formats, um, like at the Security Council. But it's important for girls and women to be given the chance to have a say in the overall agenda of the event or campaign if those opportunities exist. And finally, will the spokesperson have equal access to all the opportunities available to other participants? For example, if other panelists are having the opportunity to have private meetings with decision makers, and that is of interest to the storyteller as well, are those opportunities also available to them? Uh, just as an example, whenever Women Deliver invites civil society organizations from humanitarian settings to speak at our events in New York, we also ask them about their personal advocacy goals out of the trip. Um, for example, if there are specific donors or decision makers that they'd like to meet with and try our best to set up those meetings so that they can make the most of their time there. Just something to note throughout all this um, is that if you run into an opportunity that doesn't meet one or all of these criteria for meaningful engagement and may seem tokenistic in some of its elements, that doesn't mean you need to dismiss the al opportunity altogether. But what it does mean is that we have a responsibility before we identify a grassroots storyteller to advocate to the organizers of the event or the opportunity to try and push them to ensure more meaningful engagement. So if, for example, the organizers are looking for a woman to talk about the challenges and suffering that she's faced, propose an alternative format where they can talk about the full range of their experience, their expertise, and their vision for the future. And similarly, if uh, ask if there's an opportunity for the woman to be part of the organizing committee of the event, if that's something that you think they might be interested in. It's really important for us to set this strong foundation for meaningful advocacy opportunity at the outset. So the opportunity that we present to girls and women in humanitarian settings is something that they would really find valuable to be a part of. So uh, let's have a little quiz to see if you can identify whether the following opportunity is tokenism or meaningful engagement. I'm going to read it out loud um, and then feel free to uh, submit your answer in the chat box. The UN is convening a meeting on refugee rights. The meeting will begin with a short three minute statement from a refugee woman on the challenges she faces in a camp setting. Then a panel of experts from international organizations will discuss potential solutions. Your organization is invited to nominate a refugee woman for the first talk, specifically to talk about how she suffered from gender-based violence. Then the experts panel will talk about potential solutions for women like her. So go ahead and write your answer in the chat box of whether you think this is meaningful engagement or tokenism. And then I'll also open up the call line um, for others to uh, feed in. Great, I see a lot of tokenism responses here. It is not meaningful engagement. Um, that is the right answer. Um, does anybody on the call want to weigh in on why they think uh, this is so? Let me just make sure you, oh, actually, let me make sure all of you are able to talk. So anyone who is currently, I'm going through and enabling everyone on the attendees list to be able to speak. Um, if anybody wants to weigh in on why this is tokenism in your perspective and how you would advocate to the organizers to make this a more meaningful engagement opportunity. Everybody. I see several colleagues have uh, put their answers in the chat. Yeah, I see. So uh, she should be invited to give her ideas on solutions of reality. Um, she's not part of the decision panel. Um, no opportunity to give contribution about the solutions. Yeah. And are there any suggestions for if you are going to advocate to the organizers of this event? 
for how they could change the format. What would it look like? She should moderate the INGO panel. It's a great idea. Including her in the decision panel um, so that she is seen as an expert in her own right. Yeah, these are great suggestions. I think something to keep in mind is that sometimes the uh, formats of these meetings continue to be quite strict. And while this advocacy is certainly important to push for the best possible uh, opportunity for her to share her solutions and vision for the future, um, in the event that uh, you're faced with an opportunity where that's not possible, another uh, element that you can advocate for is to ensure that she is able to propose solutions and her vision for the future in her statement itself and perhaps even give recommendations to the expert panel for them to consider uh, before it even starts. Yeah, offer her the opportunity to talk during all of the meeting, not just at the beginning. And to make closing remarks, I think that's great. Great. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on to now the next question. We encourage you to consider in an advocacy opportunity, how, when, and where does this opportunity take place? Previously, when we were asking ourselves why, uh, we were looking at the content of the meeting. And now through these questions, we really want to critically explore how the meeting is structured um, so that we can make sure that it's set up in a way for meaningful engagement and also that we can see how the structure of the meeting has implications on who might be selected for the opportunity. So uh, to do this, look at the structure of the event itself and ask yourself, is the way it is currently set up, uh, in the way that it's currently set up, is anonymity possible? For example, is it a very visible spe uh, speaking role where anonymous video is not possible? Or is it an op-ed, which as many of us know, um, cannot usually be published if it is anonymous? If, if anonymity is not possible, we strongly encourage you to consider partnering with women who have taken visible advocacy roles in the past, or who self-identify as facing no risks. Um, so perhaps instead of a, women, a woman living in besieged Syria, you could consider the head of a Syrian women-led organization who has taken visible advocacy roles in the past, who deeply understands the context um, and, and is able to do so in a safe and effective way. Another question to consider is how your organization can support the advocate, including the kind of budget and logistic support available, if there are childcare options for women to participate, and so on. Based on the nature of the opportunity, you can consider how those budget and logistical considerations broadens or narrows the profile of the person you can feasibly work with. So, for example, if childcare support is not available or breastfeeding rooms in the conference space do not exist, it would be more responsible to explore working with women who do not have young children or who have a partner who can care for their child while they're away. Also, consider where the advocacy opportunity will geographically take place and the visa policy, security concerns, and travel requirements to get there. If travel is required but is a serious concern uh, for safety considerations, you might want to expand your profile to include girls and women who face less risks, such as those who are resettled, or explore virtual engagement opportunities like a pre-recorded video. And finally, ask yourself when the opportunity will be held. Is it at the height of a crisis uh, where their skills and expertise might be needed elsewhere? Is it at a time um, in the local context where girls and women are facing rising discrimination in their community, so extra visibility could actually put them at even greater risk? It's important to ask ourselves these questions and consider the opportunity costs um, for certain advocates to participate. Uh, so as you might see, all of these questions about the content and structure of the opportunity really must be considered before you determine the profile of the storyteller. If you start at the outset with asking who they are or what they must look like, you really risk missing the nuanced details that are so important for their safety and meaningful engagement. Um, so now that we have all of this context in mind, we can now uh, turn to determining who to choose for the storytelling opportunity. Uh, 
Okay, so we strongly encourage you to work with trusted local women focused organizations or other community groups to help determine which girl or woman should be offered the opportunity. CSOs are rooted in the community, are trusted by them, and can help identify women with an interest in the opportunity um, and other sensitivities to keep in mind. Depending on the nature of the opportunity, you might also want to consider some kind of expression of interest process. So if there's wide interest, um, something that the youth engagement team does is share advocacy opportunities to a wide, uh, a, a wide range of young advocates around the world, and they can informally apply through an expression of interest process um, for consideration. And we've also listed some networks here that can be helpful uh, for identifying civil society organizations that uh, you could work with. So there's Women Delivers Humanitarian Advocates Program. Um, we have several partners in Lebanon, as well as other organizations that we are constantly in touch with. The NEAR Network is a coalition of civil society organizations. Um, uh, that's also a great resource. And of course, there's action plan. The most important thing to note here is that civil society organizations need time to find the right advocate. So when you're work planning for any given advocacy opportunity, make sure a good time is built in in that selection process. And as always, ensure that there's clear communication about the parameters of the opportunity, including the answers to the why, what, and when questions that we answered previously through our decision tree, so that communities can really keep this in mind um, as they're making a nomination. Now, to share what uh, the storyteller identification process can look like in practice, I am going to hand over the mic to Olivia Nightingale from uh, AJWS to share her experience in the Cox's Bazaar. Thank you so much, and um, thank you to everyone for joining today um, and to the staff at Women Deliver and Crisis Action for creating the space for such an important conversation. Um, so I'm going to attempt to control the, um, there we go, um, the PowerPoint. Um, my organization, American Jewish World Service, has actually been working in Burma since 2002 and immediately responded when the attacks against Rakhine State's Rohingya population began on August 25th, 2017. Support for Rohingya-led organizations is really central to our strategy, and we've been able to identify networks of Rohingya leaders and activists in the camp. Uh, which I'll speak to in, in just a few moments. So the Rohingya, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so the Rohingya population in Cox's Bazaar, which now actually totals well over 900,000 people, all have very differing perspectives about their hopes for the future, including matters related to repatriation, resettlement, restitution and justice, and then of course more pressing needs like access to education, livelihoods, and freedom of movement. Um, while there's long since been a really vocal Rohingya diaspora community, Rohingya civil society within the camps is, is really emerging despite a lot of pressure from the Bangladeshi government and camp officials to prevent them from mobilizing in any, any meaningful way. And while many people have very clear demands about what they want, they are rarely, if ever, consulted about matters that affect their lives, let alone are they allowed into key decision-making spaces um, where they could have any real say in terms of their future. Um, and this is, is absolutely one of the, the key gaps that AJWS is, is seeking to address through our Rohingya strategy. So you'll see here, this photograph was taken about 10 days ago, um, and it is a group of about 200,000 people who gathered in the camps to commemorate the second anniversary of the atrocities committed against them. You'll notice from this photo uh, that women are conspicuously absent, and this is absolutely indicative of Rohingya civil society, which is overwhelmingly dominated by men. So both in Rakhine State and now in Cox's Bazaar, women are prevented from receiving the education, they're prohibited often from working outside of the home, um, and they are absolutely excluded from key decision-making spaces and, and leadership roles. Also, you know, really important to note that the experiences of Rohingya women 
that are shared in the press are really centered around this idea of, of portraying them solely as victims of sexual and gender-based violence. And despite accounting for 52% of the population in the camps, Rohingya women have even less say than their male counterparts on any decisions regarding their futures um, and their lives and really any say in terms of how they want their stories to be shared. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, um, we're really, really keen, AJWS, to elevate the voices of Rohingya people living in the camps, particularly women in key advocacy spaces. So through a connection um, that we had established in the camps um, through trusted partnerships, we, several months ago, were approached by Legal Action Worldwide Law um, that was working with an organization by the name of Shanti Mokila, which is a, a Rohingya women's organization in the camps. Um, Law had actually come together with Shanti Mohila um, regarding an opportunity to have one of their volunteers come uh, to Geneva to speak at the Human Rights Council. What was really incredible about this process too was that Shanti Mohila had democratically selected someone who they believed, um, one of their volunteers who they believed would be really comfortable in representing um, not only her own experience as a Rohingya woman who had fled violence in Rakhine State, but also to voice you know, what her key demands were for her future. Um, and so when we were approached by law, we were asked to provide support, which was mentioned actually in a previously, previous slide, which is so important. Um, we were asked to provide support um, for this travel opportunity, and we were really, we were really keen to do so. Um, this actually marked the first time that a Rohingya woman who was stateless was able to leave the camps and travel to Geneva to tell her story in her own voice. Um, and so I, I actually, um, going to read to you um, the speech that Hamida Katoum, the woman who uh, was able to attend um, this meeting at the Human Rights Council, um, the incredible, incredibly moving speech that she provided. Um, so, Salam alaikum. My name is Hamida Katoum. I come from Batidang in Burma. I am Rohingya. I had to memorize my speech today because, like many Rohingya women, I cannot read or write. I was denied an education. In August 2017, I fled Burma to Bangladesh when my village was attacked. My Rohingya brothers and sisters were killed. My husband and mother were killed. I am the only Rohingya woman that could lead Bangladesh to tell you what happened to hundreds of thousands of us. I am here on behalf of Shanti Mohila, a group of Rohingya women who also fled the violence, who have come together to raise our voices. The name Shanti Mohila means peace women, and we want peace in Myanmar. I have three requests of the international community. First, justice, including compensation. Second, to return home in safety and security, including citizenship. Third, access to education. What's really remarkable about Hamida's story, aside from you know, her being able to travel to Geneva to share her experience, but also to demand what she wants for her future, is that it's actually translated um, into meaningful engagement in the camps. And so, as you'll recall, several, several slides ago, I showed you a photo of people who had gathered to commemorate um, the second anniversary of the atrocities. Hamida was actually the only woman who was asked to speak to that crowd of 200,000 people. And now, this, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that Rohingya civil society is going to change um, and that women will be seen as equals, but it absolutely does mark an important step um, in that push for equality. I also, I want to close this, um, this portion of the case study by reflecting on the fact that this is a really fitting time to have this conversation in the context of the Rohingya crisis, um, because from tomorrow onwards, the Bangladeshi government has announced that they will cut off all mobile phone access in the camps, which will effectively cut off you know, any lifeline that the over 900,000 Rohingya people living in the camps have to the outside world um, and their ability to share their experiences and, and advocate for themselves. And so now more than ever, it's imperative um, that we think really critically about how best to tell their stories and support their push for advocacy for what it is that they want for their own futures. Thank you. Thanks so much, Olivia.
Um, I think that was a really powerful example of both um, the efforts that you took to identify a, a storyteller in a really respectful and, and engaging way that you, the community, but also the power that that effort had um, in creating a ripple effect for the community. Um, now I'm going to open it up um, for another interactive exercise. Um, again, I'll read it first and then feel free to write your thoughts in the chat box or I think Certainly all attendees are able to speak, so feel free to unmic your, uh, unmute your microphone uh, if you'd like to make a contribution. So, the case study. In light, of recent, uh, in light of the recent outbreak of Ebola in the DRC, your organization has decided to host a side event at the UN General Assembly in New York that highlights the epidemic and calls on decision makers to increase funding for emergency responses, particularly in support of the health workforce in the DRC. This event will include a panel discussion between local health workers, epidemiologists, and U.S. policymakers who are already champions of this cause. It is at the height of the Ebola epidemic, at a time when local health workers are already overstretched and in high demand to halt the spread of, disease, of the disease. You have a budget available to support travel and logistics, but unfortunately not childcare expenses, even though you know you should. Who could you invite to put a gender lens on this conversation and what would the engagement opportunity look like? Um, as you're thinking through, I think it's a great idea to uh, revisit again um, the decision tree and, and the four questions to keep in mind um, before you determine the profile of the person that might be ideal to speak at this opportunity. So opening it up to the chat box and also to the attendees, um, uh, to give their contributions. Um, perhaps we can start with the first question. Why um, is why do we need grassroots pre present at this event? Um, is it one that is, uh, in your perspective, set up for meaningful engagement or is it tokenistic? Um, are there any elements that you have to push the organizers to reconsider um, before you, we even begin thinking about the profile of the person? Yep, uh, somebody had asked to flick back to the situation. Sure. There it is. Um, and I, the desired outcome is to call in decision makers to increase funding for the emergency response um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, particularly to invest in the health workforce. Yep, I hear, I see a comment here, local voices wouldn't have access otherwise and the international community would be deprived of the precious expertise on the reality on the ground. It's absolutely true. Um, I think uh, what we're seeing here is that this opportunity having the local health workers sit side by side with US policymakers is one that is set up for their meaningful engagement. Um, Uh, we can also move on to the second question of, um, or move on to the next few questions of how, when, and where the opportunity is taking place. Are there certain elements about how the event is structured or the resources that we have to provide to the storyteller that would uh, have an implication on the type of person that uh, you would be looking to approach? Um, so, for example, the location, oh, 
uh, challenge of finding the right balance between the international opportunity and the risk of uh, depleting further stretch resources on the ground. I think that's absolutely an important point. Um, as the case study mentions, this is at the, uh, the height of uh, an Ebola epidemic in the DRC. So something to keep in mind is that um, at a time when local health workers are already overstretched on the ground, um, what is the opportunity cost of, of coming to New York? Um, and, and also, what are the alternative opportunities available? Is there an option to perhaps have um, someone submit a pre-recorded video? Um, is it possible to uh, draw from uh, a health worker in an area um, that has a solid team to support them in their absence? These are all considerations to, to keep in mind when identifying the right fit. I see we would need someone who could urge decision makers to rethink the design of the response to empower the locals uh, to empower and support local health workers, not just fund programs that can probably be improved by bringing local expertise to the mix. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Someone who's able to travel, a challenge because of the burden of care, which often keeps women at home. Yep, someone else mentioned that the lim uh, the limitation on uh, childcare is uh, is a major issue. Yeah, that's great. Uh, somebody had mentioned that it would be good to ensure that there uh, should be opportunities for the advocate to also speak with the poli uh, policymakers beyond their one time participation. So follow up opportunities. Um, and for who, on who to invite, a local health professional worker, regardless of gender, who can speak to the specific challenges, needs that women experience as a result of this outbreak, um, and outline why exactly humanitarian needs, uh, uh, why exactly humanitarian assistance needs to pay special attention to women's health needs. Yeah. And I think there is also I, something that isn't in this case study is that it could also be a local epidemiologist or an epidemiolo epidemiologist from the region who can, can, can be brought to contribute to the conversation as well that has a gender perspective on their work. Mm -hmm. Look for other alternatives that would make it viable for a healthcare worker to participate. So go to a place with internet for video call. It's a great, great idea. Um, I think especially in situations like this at the height of a crisis when resources are, are already stretched on the ground, um, exploring opportunities for virtual engagement can really um, help lighten the burden while still making a really powerful contribution to this discussion. Great. Um, I think we have some great ideas for this case study. Um, so just wrapping up this section, um, opening it up for any questions specifically around uh, choosing stories and choosing advocates for these stories before we move on. Okay. Um, okay, seeing none, uh, we will then move on to talk about collecting stories. Um, and when we're talking about collecting stories, we're ultimately determining what is the strategic message we hope girls and women can get across uh, through their advocacy opportunity. Again, like we said before, storytelling for advocacy is very different from general storytelling by efforts. Um, the latter, we know, has elevating a story in its own right as its primary goal and as, its, as an important goal in, it, in its own right. And the goal of storytelling for advocacy is that, but also broader, to advance a particular advocacy objective um, and resonate with a very specific uh, audience. Um, as a result, it's really, really important to have honest and collaborative conversations with women advocates about these advocacy objectives and how their story can complement them. 
So doing this well and respectfully actually requires acknowledging that there is a power balance that needs to be at play. At one, on one hand, we have the responsibility to respect and acknowledge that the advocate or storyteller is an expert on their lives, experiences, and solutions they'd like to see, and not impose on their expertise. And on the, other, on the other hand, we know that we are experts on the overall advocacy strategy, message that, that work to reach specific audiences, and the format that they should be delivered in, including things like time limits and timing. And the key to really reaching this balance is mutual respect, communication, and trust. So what does this look like in practice? Um, here are some practical tips for reaching that balance that we actually drew from conversations that we had with advocates that work in the NGO working group on women, peace, and security. Um, they specifically work to bring girls and women to speak at highly structured events like at the UN Security Council. Um, but we think that these tips are really relevant for other formats as well. So the first tip is to be honest about the complicated political dynamics that are at play and don't assume that the advocate can't or won't understand them. So this requires not just letting the storyteller know what they need to know to deliver their statement, but giving them a real holistic picture of the overall event and the personalities that are at play. Share your political analysis. What do you expect certain members might say in response? What do you expect some of the questions might, might be for them? This is all really helpful guidance to share before the storyteller begins working on their statement or contribution. Also, don't shy away from sharing your expertise on what has worked in the past and what messages are likely to resonate. Uh, for example, when we invite advocates to speak at Women Deliver events uh, with decision makers, we often share some guidance on, on messages that we know have resonated with decision makers in the past, as well as some technical guidance on, on the timing um, that decision makers often pay attention for, which is really helpful for advocates from, context, from different contexts. Uh, the last bullet is specific for the UN Security Council, which I know many of you have an interest in learning more about. Um, if you think that there are council members that might try to influence the statement, you can choose to keep it confidential until it's delivered, and that's all to help ensure that the advocates can still have the power to shape it as they wish. After these conversations, it's important to let the speaker decide uh, what they ultimately want to say. I think we have a, a tendency as headquarters-based staff to want to edit a statement to something we think might seem more polished to a global north or western ear. What we actually know from experience that this runs the risk of making a statement seem staged, not in her own voice or unauthentic. So after, um, Similarly, after the statement is delivered, um, it's important to follow up consistently to make sure she's comfortable uh, with what she has said. If there have been any political changes at home that might have been um, that might have made what she said seem more sensitive. Um, and again, uh, at any given event, uh, there might be friend, friendly partners, council members who have embassies uh, or, or, or offices at her home country that might be able to support her as needed. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, this time to Elizabeth uh, to share a case study on how Oxfam supports South Sudanese women uh, with their advocacy opportunities. Over to you, Elizabeth. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, great to share with you today. Um, Anjali, I'm trying to operate the slides. Um, if you can flip. Okay, I see it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, oops. Okay, so I'm going to share some of um, <laughs> I'm going to share some of my um, experiences working with women um, on different types of written products, um, op-ed speeches, and literary works. 
Um, the goals um, that I always keep in my mind are one, to try and ensure as much ownership over the product, product as possible. Um, we don't want like the editing process to be so overwhelming that in the end, um, the woman doesn't recognize her own voice or, f or feel like the, the product is hers. Um, then I think ideally the process should contribute to longer term capacity building. So, you know, after going through the process of developing um, uh, the product, you know, the woman should ideally get some, uh, have learned something, some type of skill or maybe access to a platform um, that she can use in the future. Um, and ideally the opportunity would have some transformational impact. So yes, obviously, you know, the advocacy goal, but then also on the woman herself, um, you know, to think about is this um, raising her profile in a way that will be strategic for her? Is this um, uh, creating a, a, a connection with um, someone who may be a future mentor or help her um, in other ways? You know, we, we would want the opportunity to be kind of part of a, a ripple effect that may um, help her ampl amplify her voice in other, in other spaces. Um, so in terms of the process, some of the key questions I think are, how are the woman's writing skills? How are her storytelling skills? Um, this links partly to education level, but then also to, um, but you know, I think storytelling is also, um, yeah, not necessarily a learned skill, but um, you know, can just be a natural one. Um, what are uh, her computer skills and computer literacy? So will she be able to type something or not? How much public speaking experience or confidence does she have? What are her language abilities? Um, is there time for face-to-face -face interaction beforehand and how much? And then what is the format of the, of the product? Um, so uh, here's an example of, um, of a q and I did with um, Susan, a refugee uh, leader living in Northern Uganda. Um, and I think my first point is about the, the form. Um, I think question and answers uh, are, are nice um, because it's a, an easy way for women to speak in their own voices. Um, and yeah, and to be honest, like, but, you know, beyond crisis action, I think most many INGO advocates um, kind of struggle with this balance of, um, of uh, an organizational kind of expectation about their own voices <laughs> and then um, supporting the voices of, of, you know, grassroots women. And I think what's kind of, you know, it, nice about a and a is that, you know, it can be a and a with Elizabeth Ashamo Deng, but, um, you know, my voice is only the questions and the majority is still, you know, the women speaking. Um, and in terms of the process, you know, for this, I wrote the questions um, and then I, uh, I just emailed them to Susan. She's highly computer literate. She typed the answers. I did minor edits and, you know, within a day or two, um, we had this on our, our website um, and this was part of the 16 days of activism. Um, in terms of like the transformational impact on her, um, you know, I, I did this really to um, to raise her profile as a as a woman leader who's um, highly articulate um, and you know is one of those people who um, who is I think an uh, often an appropriate choice for advocacy um, yeah because she's because of her educational level um, her leadership experience the fact that she lives in a refugee camp. Um, but yeah, um, so I shared the product with internally within Oxfam and with many humanitarian agencies. And I think it did have that impact of, um, of you know, kind of legitimizing her as a, as a spokesperson for refugee women. Um, so here's another example um, of uh, Grace Kenyi, um, who uh, did a briefing for the Security Council last September. Um, and in terms of the process, I think this, um, one of the good things with this was that um, she, um, we were 
writing the speech as we were having a civil society strategy meeting immediately after the revitalized peace agreement was signed. So there was the opportunity to ensure wider buy-in buy -in and endorsement of the messages. I think often that's that's kind of missing in the, in the process. Um, but when um, we're supporting people to take on opportunities like presenting before the Security Council, I think it's I, it's always ideal that what they say is um, representative of of you know a wider body. Um, so in terms of process, she wrote the initial draft. I talked it through with her and supported edits, um, and then. She, she read the text aloud a few times. So, you know, with the question like, does this sound natural to me? Can I, you know, yeah, does it feel good when it's coming out of my mouth? Um, the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace and Security supported with the edits. Um, and we kept grace and copy throughout the final editing process. I think this seems maybe something obvious, but I, I've had experiences where, you know, the, the purported author or, sp or speaker gets dropped out um, in inter-INGO conversations about format or wording or cutting, cutting language, um, getting the word count right. Um, but I think it really dignifies the person and, and also allows them to kind of see the nitty gritty and, and learn from that um, to keep them um, as part of the process. Um, and then, yeah, and then the link was shared with other other people to watch. Um, uh, I think, yeah, you know, so sometimes we we do things without really making the most of the opportunity. Um, and and I think the NGO working group does a great job of um, putting the speech on the website and um, using Twitter and sharing the link, you know, to really make sure that it's um, getting beyond the Security Council room. Um, and Jilly, can you help me flip? Thanks. Okay, so another thing I don't think we do quite enough is um, supporting writing skills sort of in the abstract. Um, you know, often the support um, is, is um, for a specific output. Um, so last June, we worked with FemWrite, a Ugandan Association of Women Writers, to hold a five-day writing retreat for South Sudanese women. Um, and this was focused on um, literary, literary nonfiction and fiction, poetry. Um, and uh, so we talked about different styles of writing. Um, they had uh, lectures on basic um, storytelling skills and a lot of practice and feedback from FemWrite Network and, and, um, and the other women. Um, this is ongoing, and the eventual product will be an, th an anthology of women writers. Um, I included here um, a video that we don't have time to watch, but I think you'll get the link after. Um, so one of the poets who participated in the retreat um, was filmed by UNHCR um, following the retreat. Um, yeah, reading one of the poems that she wrote during the retreat. Um, so some of the key lessons to summarize, I think the more face-to-face -face time for, for coaching and working through a product, the better. The more independent work done before outside edits, the better. So, you know, try to explain what the opportunity is so that the, the woman can, you know, think it through herself um, before you stick your fingers in. <laughs> Um, and then the more we can impart general drafting, preparation, speak, speech writing skills, the better. Um, and don't be satisfied with mediocrity. Um, so I, and I say this like because often um, we're in a hurry and we don't take time for the face-to-face. -face. We don't take time to, um, to listen to a woman practice her speech out loud um, or to uh, give advice on, you know, basic things about keeping your hands still when you're speaking. Um, or, you know, we say, okay, you know, her English is not great, so it's okay if there are grammatical errors. Um, yeah, but I also say this as, as to be slightly provocative because, um, because I, I often find it also uncomfortable 
to be um, imposing, you know, set word counts and styles and structures um, on a woman, um, knowing that that is, um, you know, a pretty heavy filter to the authenticity um, and like the freedom of her ability to self-express. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we we decided to try the writing retreat. Um, uh, yeah, to give an opportunity for a looser types, more free types of expression. Thanks, I'll end there. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, I think this was a really great case study uh, to, to give us some concrete, a concrete example of how uh, to effectively support an advocate and the high level speaking opportunity and advocacy opportunity. And I think it was also really great to hear uh, how um, Oxfam is approaching doing capacity sharing um, along with storytelling for advocacy and how those really go hand in hand. So thank you. Um, we will now turn uh, to our next interactive exercise for this segment um, and again open up to thoughts for all attendees. You can either type your thoughts and contributions in the chat box or um, I believe all attendees are able to speak so you can also voice them aloud by um, uh, unmuting your microphone. So I'll read it first. Uh, since the start of 2015, more than 900,000 Rohingya refugees from Myanmar have been forced to seek refuge in the Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, due to atrocious levels of violence uh, against them at home. Rohingya girls and women face significant risks before, during, and upon arrival in the Cox's Bazar, especially when it comes to gender-based violence. Your organization is working to document the stories of girls and women in Cox's Bazaar to inform advocacy to global decision makers that demands more concerted action to protect and support these communities. How would you approach the story collection effort? So again, opening it up in the chat box for thoughts, I'll give you some time uh, to, to write out your thoughts or feel free to unmute your microphone um, if you'd like to make your contribution out loud. And something to keep in mind as you're thinking it through um, is uh, both uh, how to identify girls and women, as we've discussed in the previous segment, but also how to support them in, in sharing their stories in a, in a safe and, and meaningful way. I see a comment here. Um, I think the approach CARE adopted in Syria would be great here. Train local women to document these stories. Um, it's a great suggestion. I think this goes back to Elizabeth's point about capacity sharing um, and, and storytelling for advocacy going, going hand in hand. Other thoughts? Yeah, I wonder if there are local women's organizations that we could partner with to help sensitively collect the stories uh, in the women's own language. I think that's a really important uh, suggestion. Um, I would consider video as a medium and collect the stories of multiple girls and women, allowing them to speak in their own language and using subtitles. It's a great idea. I think all of these ideas are getting to the point of really making the storytelling opportunity uh, feasible and accessible. Um, how about how how would you communicate uh, the this effort itself? Would you simply be asking somebody for their story, or is there more context that you, and guidance that you would want to provide? Uh, there's another great uh, idea here to try to identify places where women and girls can go and uh, feel relatively safe to share their stories and confidence. 
uh, partner with trusted uh, journalists and facilitate visits. Um, there's a great idea here about thinking about different art forms, painting, photography, uh, that women can do as part of the documentation. That's great, um, especially if that's a more comfortable medium to express themselves. Um, uh, I would use the two strategies explained in the case studies, uh, identifying women uh, groups in Rohingya, uh, in through the Rohingya population, find uh, how they could re represent them, collect some stories among them, and train as Oxfam did uh, to talk to global meetings, um, uh, such as those in Geneva or the UN Security Council. Um, I guess getting to my previous question as well, I think something that would be important in this situation is that during the story collection effort, um, explain the purpose and the objective of collecting those stories. What are what is the audience? What are uh, the expectations of this advocacy? Yeah, ex definitely explain to potential interviewees who are we're trying to influence here. I think that's so important. I think that goes back to uh, a couple slides ago where we said that it's it's really important to convey um, not just what an advocate or storyteller needs to know about their one um, advocacy opportunity, but the full context of who we're trying to influence um, so that they can make decisions around that. Um, somebody brought up sensitivity and security issues. I will work with women who are speaking about the issue already. Yeah, um, especially if gender-based violence continues to be a risk, it says, upon arrival in the Cox's Bazaar, if there's gender-based violence um, that, that can result from a, a additional visibility that's definitely a consideration to make um, and also to think about how collecting the stories can be healing and, and empowering for women great um, these are all some great uh, ideas and uh, to, add, to actually answer the question I'm going to turn it back over to Olivia to share what her story collection efforts in the Cox's Bazaar looked like in practice Thank you so much. Um, so I think in order to sort of better situate ourselves and what um, our particular endeavors have looked like in, in Cox's Bazaar in terms of storytelling, um, I want to first take a little bit of a step back and, and talk a little more broadly about AJWS's approach to, um, to how it funds. So we work in 19 countries all over the world and in each of those countries we overwhelmingly prioritize support for locally led organizations, um, recognizing that these organizations are of the communities themselves, and because of that, they are best placed to identify problems and long-term solutions to those problems. And so, um, you know, I think something that is a recurring theme both in this crisis response and in other interventions that we've been involved in is, is humility and recognizing what our role needs to be um, and that communities and community leaders need to be at the forefront of, of any decisions that are made about them uh, themselves and, and their futures. Um, and so this is certainly no different in the case of our Rohingya work. Um, we had actually prior to this latest crisis been working in Rakhine State with Rohingya leaders um, and we have long-term partnerships with these organizations, as well as actually with Rakhine organizations um, who worked alongside Rohingya communities um, in Rakhine State. These relationships actually continued uh, when the crisis began, um, and we, um, through these relationships, have actually been able to identify new partnerships in the camps um, who are working with Rohingya staff and volunteers. One of these new partnerships actually includes an organization that's really working to build the capacity of a team of Rohingya volunteers. Uh, they have about 80 Rohingya community health volunteers, and that number is actually growing. Um, again, all of these volunteers are Rohingya, and actually many of them are women. And so due to the cultural norms, um, it's been quite challenging for most NGOs who are able to hire volunteers. Um, to identify Rohingya women who are able to work in the camps. Because this partner that we're working with actually does have Rohingya staff, they know the communities living in the camps, they have the trust of the communities working in the camps, um, and they've actually been able to successfully recruit and have continued to recruit Rohingya women to work as community health volunteers. Now, of course, 
this isn't just as straightforward as them working, being trained as community health volunteers um, and going from home to home um, to, you know, assist communities who maybe don't have, or populations that don't have access to healthcare or um, need additional training on water sanitation and health. This organization is focusing on, on building the broader capacity of their volunteers, empowering them as leaders, um, and allowing them to share their experiences and advocate for themselves. So I wanted to share a little bit more about this model because I, I really think it's indicative of our approach to storytelling. Um, because we work with community-led organizations, um, we are able to, um, sorry, um, we are able to really learn from and take the lead of our partner organizations in terms of what is culturally appropriate and what is sensitive. So in the context of the Rohingya crisis, what this means is that we, um, because we are really concerned about elevating the voices of Rohingya women, you know, we really try and take into account all of the really important cultural sensitivities that are at play. So that includes hiring female interpreters who themselves are Rohingya, so that women that we are interviewing or speaking with are actually comfortable um, and, and feel safe. You know, from the outset, we also want to make sure that anyone that we're speaking to understands why it is we are speaking to them, that they have a say, um, as someone actually mentioned, I think in the chat box earlier in response to the, um, the question that was posed around this crisis, um, that they understand why it is they're being interviewed, what the purpose is, um, and that they have a say in what the broader advocacy messages should be. Um, and that we, we are really clear about the fact um, that we, you know, that we prioritize what it is that they want, that we are here to elevate their voices. We also only bring female staff on these trips um, involved in interviewing um, partners. So while we do have obviously male colleagues who are working on this, um, it's only female staff who are involved in story collection. Um, we also, and this is the case in, in many contexts, but certainly uh, in the Rohingya context as well, we really follow the lead of the older people in the room. Um, they really help to set the tone for what the conversation will look like and the um, we want to make sure that we are not crossing any boundaries um, and that we are deeply respectful of, of everybody's you know, feelings, um, which also speaks to another very important point. You know, everybody that we speak to is deeply, deeply traumatized and a huge gap in this response. And again, no different than many other responses is a lack of, of adequate psychosocial support. And so it is imperative that when we speak to people, we are not re-traumatizing them. Um, and also, you know, in a context where women are more often than not seen almost exclusively as victims of sexual and gender-based violence, we need to be incredibly sensitive to that. Um, lastly, and this is something that I think we will continue to grapple with as this crisis continues, um, is collection of evidence for broader, um, broader justice efforts. So one example of that is the International Criminal Court, who is doing some preliminary um, work um, to gather stories. We want to make sure that a lot of the same people giving testimony over and over again and being tapped for that testimony. Um, as is to be expected, what often happens is that people slightly change their stories because they're asked the same thing over and over again. We want to make sure that any stories that we are telling are not undermining those broader efforts to seek justice. Um, and so in order to do that, we work very closely with our local partners to um, learn about what they've been participating in, if people have been tapped for testimony, to give evidence. We want to be deeply sensitive to that. We want to make sure that we are not asking the same people over and over again to share their experiences. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, I, I hear that some folks are having some challenges unmuting themselves to ask questions. Um, this is the Q&A segment of this portion of the presentation, so let me try. Um, you should be able to speak now unless your microphone on your computer is currently muted. Um, there are a few folks that are using an older version of Zoom that might not enable you to speak, um, but currently 
Um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, write them in the chat box or you are all currently unmuted um, if you'd like to speak as well. All right. Um, okay. Uh, seeing no questions, uh, we will move on to our final segment of the webinar, uh, where we're going to share some tactics for sharing stories, um, including some guidance on uh, how to choose a medium, narrative, visuals, and how to report back. So, so we'll start off with choosing a medium. As with everything else, it's really important to not only consider the potential reach and audience, but also how, that fit, how the medium fits with the lives of girls and women you are working with. Here are four examples on the screen of, of medium, um, mediums that we know have worked well in our prior advocacy efforts, but I think that there have been some other great ideas in the chat box that have been really creative about using art and photography and music that are also potential um, opportunities to consider. Um, so starting off on this list, we've already discussed speaking opportunities a fair bit. Um, we know often anonymity here is less likely um, unless there are opportunities to push for virtual engagement, and that's something that you can always explore doing. Um, and we know here that the contribution is often time bound. And this can be really attractive for some storytellers for whom it is their first time um, or who prefer this more time, to, time bound storytelling experience. Um, but for those who want more time and space to share their perspectives and solutions, you could also consider exploring traditional media opportunities like op-eds and media interviews. Uh, in most op-eds, uh, anonymity is difficult, unfortunately, to get published, but anonymous Q&As are accepted by a number of outlets. We know, for example, that the New Humanitarian, Reuters Trust, and The Guardian are just a few examples of outlets that have a keen interest in articles written by those most affected by humanitarian emergencies, uh, including girls and women. So we encourage you to get in touch with those editors if that's something you'd like to pursue. And of course, build in the time, um, as Elizabeth mentioned, to make sure that that is done in a very uh, reasonable um, way to help uh, share capacity um, and, and that women have the full context they need to, to explore that opportunity fully. Social media is another great avenue to ensure more freedom of expression. Uh, one thing that we've done at Women Deliver for our own advocacy campaigns is have women from humanitarian settings take over either our Instagram or our Twitter accounts for anywhere between 30 to 60 minutes, um, especially around a big milestone. Um, of a campaign for us. Uh, before the takeover, we work with the advocate to pre-draft messages and photos, uh, communicating as we would for any other advocacy goal, um, what we hope to be uh, the outcome and the objective and context. And then we schedule these on our account um, beforehand so that you don't need to worry about internet connectivities during the scheduled takeover time. And finally, one other medium just to raise here is to consider how storytelling from girls and women can be incorporated in a research document or publication. It's really important to consider qualitative stories from girls and women as evidence in their own right. And part of legitimizing it as such um, ensures that these is, is really ensuring that this is included in technical documents side by side with our own analyses. Um, just as an example, earlier this year, Women Deliver published an edition of the Overseas Development Institute's Humanitarian Exchange Magazine, um, which was on best practices for gender-sensitive humanitarian action, where nearly every article in that magazine was co-authored by a representative from a woman-focused CSO um, or a representative from those communities. So again, these are just a few ideas to keep in mind as you're thinking through um, ways to elevate these stories. Um, next, when you're shaping the narrative, it's really important to be conscious about the choice of words we're using and making sure that it's, uh, it's in a way that respects girls and women and that we put forth as advocates. There are small things we can do that can really make a difference to ensure respectful representation of girls and women. We've talked about the first at length and that's ensuring that girls and women have the opportunity to share their vision for the futures and their solutions. 
um, that they'd like to see and not just the problems that they face. It's also important in our own descriptions to describe the strength, the resilience, and the leadership of girls and women, and not just the enormous challenges that they face. And finally, in an effort to avoid stereotyping and reductionism, it's really important uh, that we recognize our responsibility to introduce girls and, women, and girls and women in a way that captures their full realities and not just one of the most horrific moments of their lives. Um, we see sometimes quite often um, at events having someone introduced as a gender-based violence survivor, but it should really go beyond that to capture any professional titles, advocacy causes, and other descriptors that are important to, to the woman to be um, highlighted. And the same logic really carries forward as we choose visuals as well. Um, we know that photos showing difficult conditions facing girls and women in humanitarian settings is important and can have a huge impact, but it's just as equally important that these photos are captured with consent and with context. And it's also important to diversify the photos that are available of girls and women in humanitarian settings and make an effort to capture their resilience and their advocacy and their leadership. I think many of us witnessed, for example, the incredible power of the photos of women revolutionaries in South Sudan who um, recently went viral they, uh, and the photos of them standing on top of cars to demand their rights. And we know the action and attention that, can, that this kind of image can provoke. And, and the final and perhaps most important step in storytelling efforts is one that is often overlooked, and that's reporting back. After the storytelling effort is completed, it's important to check back in with your advocate in a number of ways. First, to ensure that the final product is available to her in the language that she speaks. Um, that could take the shape of translating an article or um, video testimony at a speaking engagement, um, as well with the civil society organizations that you worked with to collect the story. Uh, something to keep in mind here is that if there were any security concerns or anonymity considerations during the storytelling collection effort itself, it's important to keep these also in mind when you report back. So not mailing the final storytelling product um, if there is a risk that it could be interceptive and her uh, identity revealed. You should also communicate the impact or influence resulting from her engagement. And last but not least, um, allow uh, the woman to provide feedback on what worked and what didn't. Um, so you can keep this in mind for, for future storytelling efforts and really help it guide your work in this area. So for our last case study, I'll turn it back to Elizabeth to share a little bit about the Born to Lead campaign and the deliberative uh, narrative choices they made to show girls and women as powerful agents of change in their communities. Um, thanks. So, um, the Born to Lead campaign. This was launched just a few weeks ago in Juba by um, by our South Sudan team. Um, Angeli, can you help me flip? Okay. So, um, yeah, the the name of the campaign is Born to Lead or Nuswan Gidam in Juba Arabic. The campaign goal is to push for a future where South Sudanese women and girls have the power to influence the decisions that affect their future through equal participation in peace building and policy making. Um, it's a campaign done in partnership. Um, it was co-created and chaired by Crown the Woman, um, a civil society organization based in Juba, um, and uh, includes a participation of seven other civil society groups who form a steering committee. Next slide, Anjali. So the key tactics that we're using is um, one, really celebrating and showcasing women leaders. Um, and I'll show you, you know, some of the images um, from the campaign. But as, um, yeah, as Anjali was describing, like we really are trying to use um, positive images showing women who are challenging gender stereotypes, doing unusual things, um, yeah, and proclaiming, celebrating their 
their power and their voices. Um, one of the key elements is also the continuous in-country and face-to-face -face engagement with the partners for the campaign. Um, so the, the, the whole campaign was really designed closely with Crown the Women and then pitched to a broader group of, um, of women's organizations in Juba um, who decided then whether they wanted to participate become part of the steering committee and then we've had weekly or bi-weekly meetings with them um, uh, deciding on what needed to be done for the campaign and really you know ensuring that everyone is keeping in touch and everyone is making their own contributions um, another thing is uh, taking the campaign across South Sudan um, so there will be launches of the campaign um, in Rumbek in a couple of weeks and they're also on offline actions um, so just yesterday they launched a, a campaign for um, well a campaign within a campaign or a petition um, for the 35% women's participation quota to be uh, respected when the transitional government is hopeful fully formed in November um, and that's a yellow ribbon campaign where people are putting on yellow ribbons taking pictures of themselves or just wearing yellow ribbons um, around the country um, and we also created a song sheet um, for the campaign jointly with the women's organizations involved and I think this has been important because it's um, it was done jointly and it really empowered um, all of the adherents to the campaign to be able to speak uh, about the campaign um, and they've been doing many radio shows in Juba um, and interviews um, our, my colleagues have been trying to ensure inclusivity of the participants um, and media opportunities next slide Anjali So one of the, the key products um, was a, a video. Um, and I think one of the lessons for this was um, just thinking about the woman, the specific woman you're working with. So I think many of you on the call know Rhea Williams, um, the director of Crown the Woman, who's young, like very funky, very spunky, very personable. Um, and and so we made a video of Ria traveling around South Sudan, interviewing women who were taking on leadership roles or doing unusual things. Um, and yeah, she's the narrator, she's the guide. Um, so it really, yeah, puts her at the center of the video and allows her to be the storyteller. Um, so I, I think the format of it worked, worked really well. Um, and worked well because yeah just because of Rhea and and her on-screen talents um, and I also think the video was uh, like in terms of her transformation I think it was a really you know powerful and positive experience for her being able to travel around and and just have that um, opportunity to to interview women next slide Um, okay, so the last three slides are just sharing some of the, the positive, um, positive um, uh, photography material that we're using as part of the campaign. So this is one of the women, these, yeah, these are different women. This is Betty Sunday, I think many of you know. Um, yeah, and some of the women in the video that Rio interviewed. The last one is of a, a female Boda Boda driver. Um, I think in WOW. Yeah, and this was the image we did for um, World Humanitarian Day, the last slide. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, this uh, wraps up the third segment and the last segment of our webinar. So we now turn it over to you to ask anything on your mind. Um, 
uh, if you have any questions about specific campaigns that you're working for or anything else that was brought up uh, during the webinar. And I will unmute one more time. Anjali, this is Catherine. Um, it looks like we have some questions in the chat box. Um, so I can read a couple of these through if you'd like. One of them is, how do we avoid gender being just about women's experiences? Um, and then another one is, can we give some examples of photos which can impede humanitarian action? So yeah. maybe we can start with those. Yeah, and open it up to the panelists as well. I'll address the question about photos that impede humanitarian action. It's actually hard to see from the photo itself whether or not it is. It's really the experience of how that photo is captured. Um, I can give an example from a, a previous role um, where uh, on in, in, an, in the island of Lesbos in Greece, um, there was a situation where there was a uh, an arrival of uh, asylum seekers on a dinghy um, on the on the coast of Lesbos, and there was a number of photographers and and journalists that were also there at the same time to capture uh, what that uh, looked like uh, for people to arrive um, at the outset. Unfortunately, given how many people there were and and the nature of the types of photos that were being taken, there was really little being done to establish consent and also um, were actually getting in the way of um, humanitarian relief workers that were trying to distribute um, essential aid at that time. So it's really hard to show in a photo um, what that looks like because the photo itself you know, it, you don't see pushing or nudging humanitarian relief workers out of the way or how many photographers were there because photographers are quite conscious to capture that. Um, but it's really that experience of how um, the photo was being taken. And the way to avoid that is really working with photographers that are, um, who recognize the sensitivities of working in this context, who adopt a more fly in the wall style photography, and indeed uh, local photographers um, from the area as well. Um, I actually, uh, if I can, I'll speak to um, an incident actually that happened a few weeks ago um, where a photograph was circulated. Um, a professional photographer had captured this moment of men and women dancing in the camps um, and it was circulated pretty widely. Um, given sort of the conservative nature um, of Rohingya culture was really, really seen as, as incredibly inappropriate and the people who were featured in the photo faced a significant amount of harassment. It also put any of the female volunteers in the camp um, in a really difficult position where um, there was sort of increased repression because it was seen as like a, an incredibly inappropriate thing to have done and then to have captured. And so I think understanding what those <laughs> cultural sensitivities may be should be like step zero in trying to um, to capture uh, photographs to be used for humanitarian aid and, and humanitarian advocacy. Great. Um, I know there was a question also about um, ensuring that gender uh, gender sensitive storytelling is reflective of everyone's experiences. I don't know if other panelists want to address that. Um, I mean, the one very simple answer I'll provide is that um, certainly we know from all of our work that humanitarian emergencies affect girls, women, um, non-binary uh, identifying people differently, and it's really important to listen to communities. Um, and, and, and try our best to, to represent and build up as many voices as possible and lift them up and elevate them so that um, so none of their voices are, are overlooked in our full understanding of, of humanitarian emergencies, which currently I think uh, we largely see them as, as gender blind. So the, as many voices as we can lift up as responsibly as possible, the more that we can better uh, help world leaders understand um, how these situations affect uh, people differently. Were there other questions, Catherine, that you noted in the chat box? Um, the only other one, you might have already kind of touched on this. Um, we've gotten a couple questions about gender not just being a 
about women's experiences. So maybe if someone could talk about kind of the men and boys advocacy um, around these issues, that could be helpful. Um, Let's see. And which communications methods do you use to report back? For example, um, an article to be uh, to the person when they choose to remain anonymous. So there's another one. Oh, and then finally, we have one specifically to Elizabeth. How do you plan to disseminate the literary materials to amplify gender and peace in South Sudan, especially in a way that is accessible to the audience who cannot read or those that don't have access to YouTube? Hmm. Um, thanks. That's, uh, I guess that's a challenge to us. <laughs> um, okay, so there will be an anthology. Um, we are thinking about doing like, yeah, more videos or podcasts of the women performing. There will be um, a, one or more launch events. Um, and I guess, yeah, I mean, maybe through um, the events or performances um, is one way of taking it to other audiences. Um, yeah, but beyond that, um, yeah, I think those would be my ideas. Oh, and then radio, of course, which we've already, already used already. Um, yeah, we've been working closely with iRadio on a, a women's only radio show. Um, and some of the women writers have already spoken about the retreat experience and performed on the radio. Um, and the question on how to share, uh, how to report back, um, especially things like an article, uh, if email it's not possible, um, I think it's good to refer back to the original mode of communication that was used. Uh, and then also, I mean, ideally, there would have been a relationship with the local civil society organization um, uh, that you can share the final material with, and then they can determine a safe um, and sensitive way to report back. Uh, there are also, I've seen cases where um, uh, even when sharing with a civil society organization, you may choose to um, black out certain pieces of information like the author or a photo that's included in an article. Um, so even if that, if there is a situation where that's intercepted, it's not necessarily associated with a particular identifiable person in the community. Great, um, I see that we are a little bit over time. Um, so uh, if there are no, many, uh, no more questions, um, you can feel free uh, to continue the conversation offline. Um, my email is there, I can put you in touch with some of the other speakers as well if you have specific questions for them. Um, thanks again to all for joining this conversation on gender sensitive storytelling for humanitarian advocacy. Thanks again, of course, to our speakers for their uh, amazing contributions to, their, uh, to the discussion. Um, and like you mentioned before, we have recorded this webinar um, and we'll share the recording via email if you'd like to get it um, to revisit anything uh, during a future advocacy opportunity that you're exploring, or if you'd like to share it with any colleagues or partners that were uh, unable to join uh, and who may be interested. So thanks so much again, everybody.